Chapter 27 After church, the minister came back to the house with my aunt, Miss Eloise, Miss Emma, and Inez for coffee and cake. I lay across the bed in my room, looking out the window at the stack of bean poles in the garden. As far back as I could remember, my aunt would pull up the rows of poles at the end of each season and stack them in the same corner of the garden until a new crop of beans was ready to be poled. Beyond the poles, on the other side of the road, I could see the tops of the pecan trees in Feral Jarrow's backyard. The trees had began to bud again. The buds looked like, looked black from this distance. I could see above the trees how heavy, low, and gray the sky was. I had intended to go for a drive, but I was afraid it might rain while I was gone, making the road too muddy for me to drive back down the quarter. Anyway, I had work to do, but as usual, I ended up doing only a little because of the singing and praying up at the church. After Tante Lou and her company had been at the house a while, she came into my room. You sleep? she asked. I'm awake. Reverend Ambrose likes to talk to you. What about? I lay on my back, gazing up at the ceiling, my hands clasped behind my head, so that my arms stuck out, forming a cross. I done told you that's bad luck, my aunt said. Without shifting my eyes from the ceiling, I unclasped my hands from behind my head and clasped them on my chest. Tante Lou stood there looking at me. He can come in? Sure, he can come in. You gonna put your shoes you gonna put on your shoes and tuck in that shirt? She asked. I'll put on my shoes and tuck in my shirt, I said. She stood there watching me a while. Then she left the room. I sat up on the bed and passed my hands over my face. When the minister came into the room, I had tucked in my shirt and put on my shoes, and I was standing at the window looking out at the garden. My aunt had prepared half a dozen rows about 30 feet long for spring planting. She would start her planting the week after Easter if the ground was dry enough. The minister stood behind me and I turned from the window to look at him. Care to sit down, Reverend? There were only two chairs in the room, the one at my desk and a rocker by the fireplace. You go and sit down, he asked me. I don't mind standing. He looked at my desk. I see you've been working. I tried to, afraid I didn't get too much done. He sat down in the chair and looked up at me. They learning anything? I do my best, Reverend. He nodded his bald head. I do the same, my best. My back to the window, I waited to hear what he wanted to talk to me about. He looked down at his hands and rubbed them together. For a man his size, he had really big hands. He rubbed them again before raising his eyes to me. There ain't much time. Jefferson? Yes. Three weeks. Not quite. Minus couple days, I said. He nodded his head, a small, tired little man. He had preached a long sermon today and it showed in his face. He ain't saved. I can't help you there, Reverend. That's where you wrong. He listened to you. I turned my back on him and looked out on the garden. You ever think of anything, anybody else but yourself? I didn't answer him. I ask you, you ever think of anybody but yourself? I have my work to do, Reverend. You have yours, I said without looking around at him. Mine is reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yours is saving souls. He don't need no more reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's where you come in, Reverend. I stared beyond the garden toward the budding pecan trees in Feral Jarrow's backyard. The sky was so low, the trees seemed nearly to touch it. When you going back, Reverend Ambrose asked behind me. I don't know. One day next week, I suppose. And what you going to talk about? I don't know, Reverend. I'm going back with Sisema tomorrow. 
I'm going to talk about God. I'm sure he needs to hear that, Reverend. You sure, you sure? Maybe not. Maybe I'm not sure about anything. I know I'm sure, he said. Yes, I know I'm sure. I looked out at the newly turned rows of earth, and I wished I could just lie down between the rows and not hear, and not be a part of any of this. This is a mean world, but there is a better one. I wish to prepare him for that better world, but I need your help. I don't believe in that other world, Reverend. Don't believe in God? I believe in God, Reverend, I said, looking beyond the rows of turned up earth toward the budding pecan trees across the road. I believe in God. Every day of my life, I believe in God. Just not that other world? I didn't answer him. And how could they go on? You ever thought about that? I looked at the buds on the trees, and I did not answer him. Well, he sat into my back. I turned from the window and looked at him where he sat at my desk. School papers, notebooks, textbooks, and pencils were there spread out on the table behind him. She told me to help him walk to that chair like a man, not like a hog. And I'm doing the best I can, Reverend. The rest is up to you. He got up from that chair and came toward me. He peered at me intently, his face showing pain and confusion. He stopped at arm's distance from me, and I could smell in his clothes the sweat from his preaching. You think you educated? I went to college. But what did you learn? To teach reading, writing, and arithmetic, Reverend? What did you learn about your own people? What did you learn about her? Her around there? he said, gesturing toward the other room and trying to keep his voice down. I didn't answer him. No, you not educated boy, he said, shaking his head. You far from being educated. You learned your reading, writing, and arithmetic, but you don't know nothing. You don't even know yourself. Well, you're doing the talking, Reverend. An educated boy, he said, thumping his chest. I'm the one that's educated. I know people like you look down on people like me, but he touched his chest again. I'm the one that's educated. He stared at me as if he could not make up with his mind whether to hit me or scream. Grief, oh grief, he muffled his cry. When will you cease? Oh, when? He drew a deep breath and then he began to speak faster. When they had nothing else but grief, where was the release? None, none till he rose. And he said there's relief from grief across the on river. And she believed, and there was relief from grief. Do you know what I'm trying to say to you, boy? I hear you talking, Reverend. You hear me talking. But are you listening? No, you ain't listening. His eyes examined me from the top of my head to my chest, and I could see the rage in his face, see his mouth trembling. He was doing all he could to control his voice so that others back in the kitchen would not hear him. I won't let you send that boy's soul to hell, he said. I'll fight with you all the strength I have left in this body, and I'll win. You don't have to fight me, Reverend, I told him. You can have him all to yourself. I don't even have to go back up there if that's all you want. You're going back, he said, nodding his bald head and still trying to control his, his voice. You owe her much as I owe her. And long as I can stand on my feet, I owe her all the, her and all the others every ounce of my being. And you do too. I don't owe anybody anything, Reverend, I said, and turned toward the window. I felt his hand gripping my shoulder and pulling me around to face him. Don't you turn your back on me, boy. My name is Grant, I said. When you act educated, I'll call you Grant. I'll even call you Mr. Grant. When you act like a man, his hand still grasped my shoulder, 
and I needed all my willpower to keep from knocking it off. He could see what I was thinking, and he slowly released his grip and brought his hand back to uh, his hand to his side. You think you the only one ever felt this way? He asked. You think I never felt this way? You think she never felt this way? Every last one of them back there, one time in their life, wanted to give up. She wanted to give up now. You know that? You got any idea how sick she is? Soon after he go, she's going to. I won't give her another. I wouldn't give her another year. I want her to believe. I want her to believe he'll be up there waiting for her. And you can help me do it. And you the only one. How? Tell him to fall down on his knees for he walked to that chair. Tell him to fall down on his knees for her. You the only one he'll listen to. He won't listen to me. No, I said. I won't tell him to kneel. I'll tell him to listen to you, but I won't tell him to kneel. I will try to help him stand. You think a man can't kneel and stand? It hasn't helped me. The minister drew back from me. His head was shining. So was his face. I could see his mouth working as though he wanted to say something, but didn't know how to say it. You're just lost, he said. That's all. You're just lost. Yes, sir, I'm lost. Like most men, I'm lost. Not all men, he said. Me, I'm found. Then you're one of the lucky ones, Reverend. And I won't let you lose his soul in hell. I want him in heaven as much as you do, Reverend. A place you can't believe in? No, I don't believe in it, Reverend. And how can you tell him to believe in it? I'll never tell him not to believe in it. And I suppose he asks you if it's there, then what? Suppose he write on that tablet you give him, is it there? Then what? I'll tell him I don't know. You the teacher? Yes, but I was taught to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic not the gospel. I'd tell him I heard it was there, but I don't know. And suppose he asks you if you believe in heaven, then what? I hope he doesn't, Reverend. Suppose he do. I hope he doesn't. You could say yes? No, Reverend, I couldn't say yes. I couldn't lie to him at this moment. I will never tell him another lie, no matter what. Not for her sake? No, sir. The minister nodded his bald head and grunted to himself. His dark brown eyes and that tired, weary face continued to stare back at me. You think you educated, but you not. You think you the only person who ever had to lie? You think I never had to lie? I don't know, Reverend. Yes, you know. You know, all right. That's why you look down on me, because you know I lie. At wakes, at funerals, at weddings, yes, I lie. I lie at wakes and funerals to relieve pain, because reading, writing, and arithmetic is not enough. You think that's all they sent you to school for? They sent you to school to relieve pain, to relieve hurt. And if you have to lie to do it, then you lie. You lie and you lie and you lie. When you tell yourself you're feeling good when you're sick, you're lying. When you tell other people you're feeling well when you're feeling sick, you're lying. When you tell them that because they have pain too and you don't want to add yours and you lie. She's been lying every day of her life, your aunt in there. That's how you got through that university. Cheating herself here, cheating herself there, but always telling you she's all right. I've seen her hands bleed from picking cotton. I've seen the blisters and the hoe from the hoe and the cane knife. At that church, crying on her knees. You ever looked at the scabs on her knees, boy? Of course you never, because she never wanted you to see it. And that's the difference between me and you, boy. That make me the educated one and you the gump. I know my people. 
I know what they gone through. I know they done cheating themselves, lied to themselves, hoping that one day all love and trust can come back and help relieve the pain.